Welcome back. In the last video, we discussed forced niceness and the unintended consequences of having toxic relationships that fail personally and professionally. Sadly, many nice people can't figure out why. They think to themselves, I was so nice. I worked so hard, gave so much. Why did they take me for granted? Why was I stepped on? Why was I passed over for raises and promotions? Nice people might even pick at themselves trying to figure this out, thinking, what did they do wrong to deserve this kind of treatment? Despite all their niceness, nice people often end up frustrated and resentful because their needs never get met despite meeting the needs of others. In this video, we're going to discuss the dark side of why you're being nice, how this factors into failed relationships, that nice people unknowingly and unintentionally co-create, and how to stop this. And by the way, if you missed part one, I'll have the link for that video at the end of this video. For now, let's recap what's wrong with being nice. Niceness comes from a feeling of inadequacy and insecurity. It's in contrast to genuine kindness, which we'll cover more in the end of this video. Niceness comes from a need for approval and validation from others. Being nice so you can feel good about yourself means you have ulterior motives. That alone is arguably selfish. Nice people often bend over backwards and are obliging for others because they're so desperate for approval that they get exploited. They do too much for people who don't deserve it, which makes them easy prey for users and takers. Nice people get into codependent relationships by giving care to others, hoping that one day the person will care for them just as much. Sound familiar? It's a gamble or risk they're willing to take no matter how many times they lose, no matter how many times they come up with the short end of the stick and can't understand why. In this kind of situation, there's an unspoken relational contract that sounds a little bit like, I'll take care of you so that you'll take care of me. Sounds like a fair and reasonable exchange, right? The problem is the other person doesn't know that because you never really completely spelled it out for them. Or maybe you did at some point, but they never agreed to your terms, yet you continued on hoping to convert them over time to your way of thinking, though they had no intention of ever changing. And they might have even expressed this to you. Still, you remained. You continued hoping against all hope. And from their perspective, you agreed with this unfair exchange of you putting them first indefinitely. When this unfair exchange ultimately fails because the giver tires of not getting their needs met, everyone loses. Because a nice person doesn't get the love and approval they secretly bargained or held out for, Meanwhile, the receiver gets resentful for not getting more. Yeah, you heard that right. <laughs> they really feel entitled to more. And why not? Think about it. I know some of you are surprised by this. I was. Okay, but let's, let's think this through. When you prioritized them over yourself, you sent the message, more or less, that you agreed with their inner narrative that they're more important than you. When both of you prioritized their needs, you validated them not prioritizing and meeting your needs. For this reason, nice people end up seeking affirmation only to receive contempt. Basically a feeling that the giver is beneath the taker and is unworthy and undeserving of consideration. Often this experience is exquisitely painful to the nice person because it's connected to past trauma from past relationships where this scenario, this storyline played out before. And the giver came into the relationship with previous self-worth wounds 
that remained unhealed. So this trauma is actually a re-traumatization of an old wound, something the taker may not even realize or care to realize. Remember this the next time you give kindness to an undeserving taker. You unconsciously agree with their inner narrative that they're more important than you and you thereby affirm their belief in that. By pursuing and pleasing a user, you're unconsciously agreeing with their inner narrative that they're entitled to this unfair exchange and you're unworthy of something more equitable. This is not healthy for you or them because takers need to learn a more balanced, equitable exchange, but they'll never learn as long as people keep giving indiscriminately. How to stop this cycle? Well, number one, you got to stop being conflict avoidant. Nice people often find themselves in this cycle or relational pattern where there's people pleasing, then they become resentful, then they repress the resentment, then feelings of frustration start leaking, and then they repress the feelings all over again. Nice people deal with conflicts by pacifying or placating others to avoid conflict. They're careful not to offend or be what others consider negative. They hyper attune to the emotional needs of others so much that they deny, ignore, and neglect their own emotional needs. Worse, they hyper attune to the emotional needs of those who aren't attuning to them. By the way, I talk more about this in my book. <laughs> if you want to know more about it, I'll have the link down below. But basically, nice people are so afraid of creating conflict or uncomfortable feelings that they stuff their feelings rather than express them. They don't want to be seen by others as bothersome, needy, creating conflict or stirring up strife. Because of this, they almost never advocate for their needs to be met. They almost never negotiate on their behalf for a fair relationship at least not openly and overtly. At best, they'll do it covertly, if at all. If a nice person is involved with a narc, when they try to express their feelings, they are gaslit. They're accused of trying to start a fight. The narc might even tell others that they're always starting fights. And in response, the nice person starts walking on eggshells so as not to upset the narc and be seen as stirring up strife by merely sharing their concerns, desires, and feelings. The result, self-muzzling, which is exactly what the narcissist wanted in the first place. Nice people's inability to be seen, heard, and felt by others adds to their frustration. Their inability to have their needs met adds further to the frustration. And this frustration becomes anger because expressing those feelings is unpleasant and socially unacceptable. They continue to repress what some might consider bad or negative feelings until the pressure causes them to leak emotions through low key expressions or not so obvious expressions such as neediness, passive aggressiveness, sarcasm, and snarkiness. If there is an outburst of rage, it's met with more anger or surprise from others who never saw this coming and see it as completely unwarranted and unjustified because the nice person never before fully communicated openly and overtly their needs. And if they did, at some point, they violated those needs by caving to and compromising core values for another, thereby miscommunicating that those needs weren't a priority to the nice person when in fact they were. The angry and surprised response from others when the nice person expresses anger reinforces the nice person's belief that repressing their feelings further should be done because they feel guilty for getting mad and basically not being a nice person. They might even gaslight themselves, blaming themselves entirely for the conflict when in fact both parties are to blame for not speaking up sooner about this and addressing it head on. See, it's a vicious cycle of toxic, circular thinking. 
where you people please, you become resentful, you repress the resentment, then you leak the feelings of frustration, and then you repress the feelings all over again. Problem is, if you're repressing your feelings, the feelings are forced to find another outlet. And this outlet can manifest in addictive behavior such as turning to food, alcohol, or painkillers for comfort, or trying to buy happiness by doing some retail therapy with shopping sprees. These addictions may be used to self-soothe mounting frustration from unmet needs. Another way to stop this cycle is stop being a people pleaser. Nice people are overly invested in an emotional payoff from their people pleasing and caregiving. Sometimes they underestimate how much anger and hurt they hold on to because it's repressed. The solution here is that nice people have got to realize that this behavior of seeking approval and validation from others is never going to boost one's value or sense of self-worth. We must learn how to validate ourselves regardless of others and validation. We must learn to encourage ourselves when no one's encouraging us. We must recognize that this codependent dynamic fosters mutual animosity, resentment from you, contempt from them. And you got to understand that you're never going to be good enough for some people. No amount of effort or personal sacrifice from you will ever fix it. And that's not your fault, nor is it your problem. Get away from those people. They either aren't compatible at best, or they're toxic at worst. Also, let go of the urge to please people who don't deserve indiscriminate kindness. Identify your real needs and feelings. Then you can take proper care of yourself and find happiness in pursuing meaningful relationships rather than giving too much to the wrong people and then getting resentful about it and then developing nasty coping mechanisms along the way for having these consistently unmet needs, which creates perpetual unhappiness for nice people. Also, knowing your needs and feelings will help you identify early on who will help meet those needs and who won't. Having a sense of self-worth that's independent of others helps you detach from those who can't or won't meet your needs so you can form healthy attachments with those who will. By the way, we'll talk more about attachment in upcoming videos, so make sure you're subscribed and have activated the bell for notifications of when that's released. That's something that you want to be notified of, along with other messages. Now, I understand this advice I'm giving you of, you know, stop being a people pleaser, stop being conflict avoidant. It's easier said than done. So let's dive deeper into the reasons why you're doing this so that you can effectively overcome it. Let's talk about the dark side of why you're being so nice in the first place. The short answer, well, it's going to sound blunt and harsh, but it's the truth you need to hear. You're insecure. You can't handle being seen as the bad person or the troublemaker. You can't manage your own emotions of how you feel when people don't like you. That's why you're trying to manage others' emotions for them so it never comes to that. You know, don't let them feel uncomfortable so that you don't have to feel uncomfortable. You feeling good is dependent upon others feeling good. But when you become more secure, you're less open to agreeing with things you shouldn't, things which inevitably seal your happiness. And you're less willing to violate your own boundaries and have them violated by others. The key to becoming more secure is that you got to embrace your shadow side. And to do this, think about your persona. Basically, the you that you present when you want people to like you. And you're being agreeable. For example, smiling when you're mad or saying you're okay when you're not. <laughs> Did you adopt a morality that you have to be likable and not cause conflict, offend, or upset? Did this come from childhood programming? to be well-behaved, you know, like in school, getting graded for your conduct. Johnny plays well with others. <laughs> like that's a totally great thing, right? Well, there's a flip side to that. <laughs> or, you know, maybe it was from parenting where you learned that love is conditional 
and that getting love from your parents is conditioned upon your good behavior. You behave or we're not going to love and accept you, right? (laughs) We're going to call you a bad person. You are bad. Well, as a result, you might think that being nice makes you a good person because of this childhood programming. You think that sacrificing yourself and the truth to please others makes you a good person. In this way, you don't integrate your shadow side, your anger, resentment from unmet needs. You don't integrate that and then you get walked on, right? You deny and you repress and you hide the fact that you're resentful about your needs not getting met. Oh, because maybe that will make you a bad, immoral person to have your own needs and want them met, right? Like that makes you selfish or something. Like other people don't do the same thing. I'm being sarcastic here. (laughs) The problem is that if you believe this way, you are confusing harmlessness with morality. This was a great point that I think Jordan Peterson brought up. He said, being harmless doesn't make you moral. It means you need to strengthen your character. And it reminds me of that quote, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And I got to remind those of you who come from a Christian background, a lot of people like to focus on the character of God being like a lamb. But don't forget, in the Bible, he's also characterized as being a lion, both a lion and a lamb. Think about that. And with Jesus, People like to focus on Jesus turning the other cheek and then forget about the passage where, you know, he overturned the tables in the temple for the money changers. Oh, that was rebellious, was it not? So there's a duality in the character of God, but we get a lot of training and programming to only be this weak person. A lot of training to be meek, but meekness is not weakness. It's power under extreme control. And back to this morality issue, I say in my book, narcissists know that you have a conscience and they use it against you. So the more you integrate your shadow side as a moral as you were taught that was, you can prevent this from happening. To connect with and integrate your shadow side, you've got to connect more with the feelings of bitterness, anger, and resentment. You've got to feel those so-called bad or negative feelings. Do you have some things you need to say and haven't? Do you need to stand up for yourself but don't? Because doing so would violate your morality, would make you a bad person or a selfish person. (laughs) Oh, a lot of us do. And then we complain about why so many people are fake these days. Then when someone speaks their truth and stands up for themselves, we call them names and essentially guilt them or preach false kindness to them. Ironic, is it not? So what kind of goodness is good? Genuinely kind people are giving because it's their nature to care without ulterior motives. Does this mean, you know, become like that children's book, The Giving Tree, and just give everything away indiscriminately till you have nothing more left to give? Does this mean you shouldn't seek to get your needs met? No and no again. Next time you're being nice to someone, just ask yourself, if this person never gives anything back to you, is that okay? Or will that anger you eventually? Ask yourself, am I doing this so they'll like me or to avoid uncomfortable feelings? Ask yourself, can I be assertive, negotiate for my own needs, and set healthy boundaries? See, genuinely kind people, they have good self-esteem. They don't manage their sense of self-worth through others' faulty appraisals and invalidations. Genuinely kind people, they love themselves as much as others. They advocate for their best interests as much as they do others. And they take responsibility for their own self-care, but they do expect to be treated with respect. They're generous, but they don't engage in user-pleaser type relationships. They know what their needs are and are willing to negotiate for them to get met. If they realize that another person is unable or unwilling to meet those needs, they respectfully disengage from that relationship to pursue more equitable relationships instead. So let me say, if you've been like me and 
spent most of your life trying to get your needs met through people who have never and probably will never meet those needs, it's time to realize the role you've played in this. By not making sure that your words and actions were congruent with your true feelings, by not making sure that your words and actions were in alignment with your core wants, needs, values, you've accommodated people who have never and probably will never accommodate you, at least not as you want, need, and value. Basically, you've aligned with people who aren't aligned with you. You've emotionally attuned to people who aren't tuned to you. And I know that's a very painful thing to hear. Because many of you are good people who want the relationship to work out. You might have wanted it more than anything. And not having that relationship work out opened a deep soul wound you desperately needed and wanted to heal. Problem is... When we don't recognize and honor core incompatibilities, such as not sharing values, core values, because we're too insecure about losing the relationship or being seen as less than by others, we wind up losing and feeling disrespected anyway. The psychological damage we're trying to avoid ends up being the psychological damage we unknowingly co-create. Worse, we don't make space in our lives for the people who will meet those needs without having to be talked into it or manipulated into meeting those needs. Granted, changing this relational pattern isn't easy. Some of us simply haven't ever exercised that muscle, so to speak. It might have been trained out of you during early childhood. It might be second nature to be unthinkingly nice and giving. So we don't know how to flex that disagreeable muscle very well, but hopefully I've shared some insights here with you that encourage you to exercise it more. Exercise that disagreeable muscle more <laughs> than ever before. By only being agreeable when that's truly in alignment with you and only being kind when it's genuine to you. Till next time, wishing you all the best. Be blessed.